a retro ramble with. This episode's special guest has produced and published numerous games in the 80s and 90s for various systems, including the MSX, Spectra Video, and NES. He has written and published books on how to program and write your own programs, which are still available to purchase on Amazon today. He also enjoys tinkering and mending old arcade machines. It gives me great pleasure to chat to Tony from Electric Adventures. Hi, how are you going? Good to um, meet in video. Um, well, a very, my very first home computer was, um, I mean, I did use other computers before I bought this one. So I suppose from the very start, it was hanging out in Tandy's and Dick Smith stores, which were a store particular to Australia. And um, Tandy's had the TRS-80 uh, Model 1, 2 and 3, and Dick Smith had their System 80s. Um, and um, I used to basically find any shop in town with a computer and, and all sorts of places sold computers back then, you know, like sewing machine shops, good classic uh, example. Um, there was this big sewing machine shop sold the Amstrads down here as an example. Um, and um, I believe it was a stationery store upstairs and, and um, it was one of those fancy stationery stores. Uh, there were TI... I first saw a TI-99 4A, so that's the original TI-99 model with the um, chiclet keyboard, um, only uppercase characters, um, and very simple basic, but it had Parsec on it. I really loved that. Uh, I fell in love with that at an early stage. Couldn't afford to buy one new, um, and but at some stage I was offered one second hand. It was supposed to come with the advanced basic cartridge, but they stiffed me on that. But I had fun playing that machine, but it was a little bit basic for me. Um, as far as programming was concerned, I didn't have any other cartridges. I only had the only game I had was TI Invaders and um, the pack, uh, the, I think it's Munch, um, I can't remember, Munch something, um, and Munch Man on uh, the TI. So that's all I had. So I, I, the only other games I could do were ones I made myself. The basics were, was very simple. So I looked around for another machine um, and um, I was also working part time at a store. Um, and that guy was interested in getting to the computer market and he had Atari 20, 2600s and television game consoles and he did have um, like an Atari 400 um, and so I couldn't afford those ones but he brought in the Spectre Video um, SV318 the one with the red joystick on the side and the rubber keyboard um, and I really liked that machine um, at the same time I was looking at a VIC-20 um, a, or a micro B. It's a, an Australian computer, uh, Z80 really based. Mm. Um, it was actually um, quite popular and is the other computer that was put into schools. So four states went with the BBC micro and three states went with the micro B. Uh, and, um, and Tasmania, where I live, is one of the states that went with the BBC micro. So. Once again, I'm just doing these things because this is where fondness of certain systems comes from. <laughs> yeah. um, and I got a speech. I ended up um, the, the owner of the shop because I helped him, you know, uh, pick a computer and, and set things up. He gave me $100 off it. So it made it the same price as the VIC-20 before the VIC-20 adding a, I would have had to have bought a 4K memory card or something for the VIC-20 to make it suitable. And I really love the fact that it had such a fantastic complex basic on it. And of course, it had the same similar graphics chip to the TI, so I was all very familiar with the um, the type of graphics you could do on the system. Um, the TI nine hundred nine four actually has the older version of the TI chip on it, whereas the four A has the newer version. Um, and there is one more graphics mode. Um, and I just started programming it uh, with one of my friends. He bought one as well, uh, who wrote a very good cricket program. Um, but I just kept on writing games. Um, and then I published a few games in one of the local magazines um, and people really liked those. So I said, oh, we'll whack some on a tape. So I started publishing multiple basic games on tapes called Program Pack. So my first one had a sprite designer on it, Lunar Lander, Galactic Assault, um, Brains, and I, I've forgotten the last one on there. It, it, it amazes me how you could... You can you could just pick up a computer and literally start your own business on something you loved back in the day. Mm. 
Oh, it was just, yeah, and, and I just, uh, as many tapes as I could make, all the people ate them up because the, there wasn't a lot of software for the original Spectre video. Um, <clears throat> there were some interesting, quirky titles, but there wasn't much else produced. <coughs> was it? Was cause um, it, it's not something, the Spectre video, it wasn't something that was quite large over here, especially, well, the MSX itself wasn't quite large over here when it, it came out, but... Is that does it run on the similar basic to the MSX then, or is it a different basic? Or yeah, well, basically the Spectra Video um, three one eight, and then had a later model, the three two eight, which is just a full travel version with sixty four k of main RAM um, and sixteen k of um, video RAM. That design um, was so the Spectra Video two two technicians from Spectra Video and two technicians from Microsoft wrote the basic the Spectra Video basic. So there was version one, version 1.1, 1. 1, um, and then the Model 2s. So, so they actually quickly sold their original consignment, which wasn't huge, and they produced a second version, which only has a single motherboard in it and cheaper to make. And that's got basic 1.2 in it, just bug fixes. So uh, no, no differences. Um, and um, they were dealing with uh, a guy called Nishi in Japan, who was Bill Gates' friend. Um, and managed to get Microsoft's uh, the license to do Microsoft's business in Japan because it was too hard for Microsoft at the time. Yeah. And he got all excited, and he took this design <laughs> of Spectre Video and the fact of this, you know, really powerful Microsoft Basic around a whole heap of companies, and said, "Let's make a standard," which the Japanese companies were full on board with, and they really got into it. So they used the base Spectre Video design to make the MSX. Um, by the time, you know, and I went round, I only made two very simple little changes. So the Spectre Video had a top cartridge port and a back expansion bus. They decided to merge those into the same port. Right. So they changed the expansion bus so I could have the cartridges in it, and you added two of, in general, most machines had two of those. Um, and the other change they made, obviously, um, they decided to have do a slightly different uh, memory mapper to allow better expansion. So the Spectre Video could actually have a reasonable amount of memory um, up to about 512k through expansion, um, but the MSX can actually have a memory space that is 4 meg. That's quite a lot for um, the same. <laughs> yeah, so inside each cartridge slot you can put an expansion bus. Ah, and inside each one of those you can do it again. So you can do it to a depth of 2. Um, so which means you can actually have 512k in every cartridge slot. And right. there's two physical cartridge slots and there's two internal mapping. So you've got technically a 4 meg memory space. Did any games actually um, take uh, bag, um, use that for up to 4 meg memory? Were there any games that came out with these? We have Space Mambo. Yeah. Um... That's an MSX2 game, of course, but and 2 plus. I'm just trying to think about 64 game. Yeah, 2 megabit ROM, yeah. That's crazy, crazy for its time, isn't it, really? And for, um, the other one I could have grabbed was um, uh, was Gradius or Nemesis 2 or 3. Um, they're 1 and 2 megabit cartridges um, in, in that order. So um, it just allowed so much... You know, that's a that's more storage space than some of the um, the later consoles. Well, when you think about at the time, like in on on the MSX that I had, it was sixty four k. That's what they were working to, and half of that was system memory and stuff. You know what I mean? So it was very limited. So to have megabytes of memory must have been beyond mm. the wild. But they probably thought they would never need any more memory. <laughs> no, no. But they they did design it because of all the different manufacturers. They wanted to add their own flavor to it. So um, they wanted it to be expandable and them to be able to plug and sell their other stuff. Um, yeah. You know, so you've got variants like Pioneer or into the, uh, there's an option on the video chip to feed in a secondary video source. And, and Sony did this as well. So on the, I've got a Pioneer MSX here. You can feed in another video source and overlay um, the computer graphics over the top of another video source. And couple that with a Pioneer laser display, yeah, yeah, and you have a couple of the MSX games that actually come on laser disc. 
that are interactive games and they use the video and they control the laser disc. Then you've got the Yamaha. They have uh, their machine has MIDI ports built into it, and one of the very first machines to have MIDI ports built into it. Um, with their wonderful keyboard, I've got one of those. It's a wonderful uh, music uh, programming environment, and their and the music software that came with those was very good. And they introduced that was the first FM sound um, on the MSX platform. Yeah. The um, Konami cartridges actually come with an SCC sound chip oh, right. in the cartridges so that's <laughs> so a game could actually add to the functionality um which other systems did the nintendo the original nintendo the reason why uh that was successful in a way was because you could virtually add anything through the cartridge port um so some of the later games have so much extra ram and um and you know add things like um you know horizontal interrupts and all sorts of things and extra sound chips. That's why some of the cartridges are so heavy. So I suppose from a programmer's perspective, <coughs> that was like you got so much choice on what you could actually do with it, with the machine? Oh, correct. And, and because also because, you know, I was learning um, and discovering, you had a great system manual that came with it, and the BASIC was so good. You could actually make quite decent games using BASIC. And then I wanted to do a little bit more, so I learned a little bit of machine code. Uh, a little bit of Z80 code and added that to the basic thing. So one of the first um, bit of nice little um, machine code routine I write. So you've got 32 hardware sprites, which is fantastic compared to other machines at the time. So I wrote a little bit of machine code where you could assign a velocity, an X and Y velocity to each sprite. So all you did was assign a velocity and then it moved it every interrupt for you. Yeah. So you could quite easily... So that's... Um, on only my second program pack, there's a game called Hopper. Right. And that does quite a decent version of Frogger in BASIC because all of the horizontally moving sprites, which are all the things you land on, are all being moved by the interrupt routine. Uh, so, it, so it gives you freeze up your BASIC to do the other side thing. So. Yeah, yeah. It's quite clever. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I ended up, you know, people liked these games and I just kept on doing all different ones and I, I based them off games that I liked on other systems. So I'd be reading magazines and seeing, you know, these Spectrum games like Manic Miner and all these sort of things. And so I'd make my own version of that. Um, <laughs> um, and I liked text adventures, so I wrote some of those as well. Um, and then after a while, the program packs are doing really well. Um, I wrote a couple of articles on that routine called yeah. Beyond Basic. Um, and after I published the first one of those, the person doing the magazine folded, so I took the magazine over yeah. um, and ran the magazine. Uh, relo so it was, comp it was Australian Computer Forum, was the, the bigger magazine in Australia. Yeah. Um, it started out in newsstands, ended up just as a mail order thing. Yeah. Uh, so I took it over and rebadged it as Micro, Micro's Gazette, still focused on MSX and Spectre Video. Um, and continue those articles and used it as a vehicle to sell my software. I, I've actually, um, obviously, I knew I was coming on. I download because I think you could download the um, PDFs from your website and add a look yes, at one. Yes, tried to preserve as many of those old magazines as I can. So, <laughs> yes, and, and, and um, I was reading because I think I gather TC is yourself who wrote the reviews, and then there's somebody else as well. Um, and I, at the back, it's yeah, something... so what. what... Sorry. Yeah, when we started the magazine, I had a group of about four or five friends who were going to help me. <laughs> um, uh, and one of my friends, Mark, lasted the longest. Um, he's Axe. So he's Axe. He does some of the reviews and stuff like that. But in the end, I ended up doing everything. Um, other than the, um, the gentleman who used to publish the, uh, the, the text adventure help page, he kept on going. And my wife drew all of the art. <laughs> so it was a team effort then. Sorry, I'm going to say, did 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 she charge you a lot for the for the artwork? <laughs> oh, she no, she enjoyed doing the artwork. So, um, and and eventually, I thought I'd try my hand at full machine code games. So the, uh, I made a simple little, um, I suppose it was always intended to be a, a Phoenix clone. Uh, called Birds of Orion. I never really finished it off. It was sort of just my first pack together of a, uh, a game where you've got a ship down the bottom moving back and forth. Um, things are diving at you. You're shooting at them. And the stars scroll in the background, right? So um, 
that was the first simple game. It was only 4K. Um, and then I thought, well, I've got to do an Asteroids. So I wrote Media Swarm. Um, and I thought those games were simple, so I published them together. So my very first machine code title was Media Swarm with Birds of Orion on the other side of the table. And people love that. And so I went a little bit further. The next game I wrote, I love Pac-Man, so I wrote a Pac-Man clone. So that's where the Munchman um, game came. And that was 6K. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, I need to write something better still. So I wrote my biggest selling game, which is called Pixidus. I went looking through the star catalogue, by the way, <laughs> until I found a name that I thought I could deal with. Um, and that's a vertical scrolling shoot 'em up. Got a little bit of, um, I suppose, Xevious in there. It also um, uh, has a little bit of Sky Jaguar, one of the MSX original shoot 'em up games. Yeah. Um, inspirations from there. Um, but it's like Xevious in the fact that you, you attack surface targets as well as the stuff coming down at you. Yeah. Um, and that game sold a lot. So I made lots and lots of copies of that one. Um, I bought a car. Um, <laughs> I, I went I went on trips overseas and stuff like that. So, um, and, uh, you know, ran the magazine and kept on selling the other things. Um, and at that stage, because I was enjoying writing the magazine so much, that's when I wrote my first book. So that's... The Complete Spec Video and MSX Programmer's Guide, the original edition, was published in 1991. And that was <clears throat> printed by me and put into white folders and sold in that format. That is old school. <laughs> old school. <clears throat> and the republished one uh, that you see on Amazon um, is that book with the Beyond Basic uh, chapters from the, from the magazines in there. And with, uh, I did lots of edits and corrections from... Um, I suppose, 20-year-old me to now 50-ish old me. <laughs> it's all that knowledge you've gained over that time you can add into it, the experience. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. And I um, I started doing a, um, which I've been quite enjoying, a video series called Let's Make a Retro Game. That's yeah, true. which for each one I wrote an article um, and I worked my way through um, because of health reasons, I've had difficulty continuing that, but <clears throat> I thought, well, why waste all that effort? So I took that information and started putting together into a book. And I thought I'd start with the Coleco first because it's, it is actually a, it's based on the same hardware, but it is technically simpler. Um, <clears throat> although partway through the process, I decided I should include information about the Atom <laughs> as well. <laughs> Because um, also with like a lot of the systems like the Coleco, there are you know listings of the BIOS. There are um, edited versions of that that pe certain people have published based on the things they were trying to achieve at a time at the time. But they've all got holes in them. They've all got errors in them. Um, so the guide that I've made in that one, I have checked every single call to the BIOS and made sure that the address was correct and that the description was correct and tried to put a calling example where I could. Yeah. Um, I couldn't achieve everything on the Coleco side of things, so the Coleco, the one, uh, because of Coleco, Adam, sorry, has its own BIOS. Um, but there is a listing in there which is more complete than some of the other ones that have been published. Um, and I do have more material to continue the video series. Um, well, I, I, that's what, because that was, I was I could do basic programming like everybody could to, to use the manual mm. that came with it, but I have been watching that because that's something I've I've always wanted to do, even if it's just a simple game. Write my own program, so I've been enjoying watching that. Um, unfortunately, as you get older, the old brain matter struggles sometimes to try and compute what's being mm. <laughs> said. But yeah, it is a good series, and I would recommend anybody watches it if if they're watching this. So, and then, you know, and then. Going through this, uh, the series to that stage, you have all of the bits and pieces you need to make a basic shooter game. Um, and uh, even up to, you know, sound and music. Uh, the trouble is at that stage, the machines diverge, different sound chips. I was able to do the sound episode and cover both systems. But really, to do the music episode, I need to go focus totally on this system and then totally focused on this system, so the, the series needs to split. Yeah. Um, and uh, But I do intend on getting back to it, and 
because I am working on a version of the same book for MSX and Spectre Video. Um, and there is going to be a sequel to the book because there is more to do with game programming. This is just a simple shooter game. You've got a ship at the bottom and things coming down from the top. So what about platform games? What about um, scrolling and all those sort of little things? So um, there is enough to fill another volume. And I think by focusing on writing the book, that will then give me the prepared material to do the video series. So yeah. I was sort of, I was in a way, I was probably doing it the wrong way around because I wasn't happy to record a, an episode until I'd written the material. Yeah. Because um, each episode, you can download exactly everything that happens in that episode with a start and an end. So you don't have to type anything in if you don't want. And the book follows the same formula. So every chapter... You have a starting point and an ending point. And for the book, I went through and I completely rewrote all of the templates and replaced the ones in the episodes. So people who followed the episodes later will actually get better uh, templates than were when it was originally published. So I'm constantly improving things. Uh, I do need to improve my own website at some stage, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was quite. It was quite. Uh, I navigated it fine. <laughs> I think sometimes you can overcomplicate things, especially some of the websites and. It makes it more difficult to find things. Mm -hmm. but, so, obviously, I've seen uh, you've got a lot of videos on your YouTube channel. You, you had about 400 titles in 2019, I think, for the MSX. Has that increased now to even more? Um, I, I have been focusing a little bit on the Coleco. So I have um, finished uh, a game called Cavern Fighter which I actually started in 1990. It was my version of Scramble. So it is completely and utterly finished on Coleco, been sent off to Collect Division to produce in cartridge form. At some stage, they've been a little bit stuck with yeah. COVID and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, But I've seen the full box design, the manual, everything. So everything's ready to go. Um, the final ROM, I, the, the last change I sent through was just to change the date to 2021, but it was actually finished before Christmas. Um no, I've started, I suppose, backporting that to the MSX Inspect video. Yeah. Um, so that one will be coming out soon. Now, I have been working on Berserk for the ColecoVision as well. Now, there are some a little bit of strict licensing conditions with that, but if, you know, at some stage its name happens to change to something <laughs> else <laughs> yeah. and it appears on the MSX, then that might happen. Yeah. Um, I have my uh, Pixie Disc game. Um, I, I actually have that working on the Coleco and I've made improvements to it. So I'm going to have Pixie Disc EX on cartridge for the MSX and Spectre Video as well. And I can now produce cartridges for the original Spectre Video. All right. Um, and just, um, there's what I was going to do my own 3D printed case, but somebody else said they were working on that. So I've just been waiting for them to do that. I do have like a very limited number of Spectre Video cases, but I don't want to use those. I want to um, print one, probably in some nice clear, you know, clear colour to make it yeah. look funky. Yeah. Um, and my friend in New Zealand has already designed me an, an MSX shell uh, mm -hmm. that involves a couple of colours, um, and they can even put an LED in there just to make it look distinctive. Might bring it to the 21st century, if you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have all the materials. It's just finishing stuff off. I'm pretty fussy um, on my own bugs, so um, I... I uh, beta testing can take a while, and I do jump between projects, as as I've, you know, just indicated. I also because I've uh, I've written a tool to help myself and other programmers. It's my MSX and Coleco Sprite and Tile Editor. Um, free to use, don't charge anything for it. People are constantly suggesting things. It allows you to put tiles in, um, sprite shapes, rotate things, uh, put animations in. Um, and even design whole screen layouts and things like that. And it's got lots of compression options. So you can literally press a button and all your assets are updated um, in how I like it. I did it for myself and I just share it with everybody else. Um, to test some of the recent changes, um, I thought it's about time I wrote a platform game. Um, so I've actually done a full graphics workup on the uh, arcade game Kangaroo. Right. And I thought that would be a nice, interesting platform game um, that I could have a go at. Um, it's not a bad little arcade game. Uh, a little bit more obscure than Don Donkey Kong and all that. Yeah. Um, but far less rights problems. So, 
It's funny you mentioned the rights problems because obviously back in the 80s and 90s, a lot of the companies just made clones of everything and didn't really care. Oh, yeah. The, the, <laughs> we see, uh, you now have the problem that um, I suppose younger generation people have actually bought some of those rights. Yeah. So they are actively enforced. Obviously, anything Nintendo, they just go at like uh, thing. And as I try to explain to some people who just blatantly try and use these properties, and I say, you're not going to be able to get away with it because... Yeah, that's an active property, and somebody will defend it at some stage. So you're, you know, it's like you're playing Russian roulette. Yeah, definitely. It's funny because I was talking to somebody else about this. We were talking about Granny's Garden on the BBC, which was a big educational title over here, and that's still mm. actually copyrighted, and that's why you can't find it anywhere on the internet because if anybody puts it on, they literally go after them, like you say, and that's a game from 1983. So. Yes, exactly. You can't assume just because you haven't heard anything about a thing for a while that somebody doesn't own the property in there. And they, you know, so, the, as an example, the Berserk uh, is owned by Gary Stern. Yeah. But so like we have we have permission from Gary Stern to produce a limited number of copies for the ColecoVision. So you've actually got. Um, it. So you can you can say officially um, authorized yes. or whatever. <laughs> Yes, but it, but at the moment it's only for the Coleco. I'll have to go back and negotiate for the other platforms. So we'll see how we go. Yeah, it, it's so. good that it's still alive. That that, that there's still that market, if you like, for for the older systems. Well, it is, and and I I believe it's growing. So I think the homebrew market is definitely growing. The number you can see a lot more people selling a lot more copies of a homebrew title for a, a particular system, even. The humble ZX Spectrum people are publishing new games on tape and and selling heaps of copies. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter if they publish the ROM or the download first or things like that. People want the real copy to go on their shelf. And um, you know things have changed. There's that. Whereas before there was a grey area. Before if somebody dared publish a ROM, they'd never sell any copies because people just play it on emulation and they didn't care. But there's enough people around with real that want to play it and appreciate the real hardware. And appreciate a nice box and a cartridge or a tape, and because they, it's that it's not just playing the game; it's the experience of taking the game off the shelf, looking at the box, opening up, looking at the manual, taking the physical media, loading an empty machine. Even like, as an example, um, my Coleco library. I'm a member of the ColecoVision Club, so I have most of the ROMs, um, but I still only play the ones that I have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 but I don't have to use the real cartridge and get it out of the box and maybe ruin the box. I can use the ROM, but I feel okay with that because I own a copy. Yeah, you've almost like you've you've paid to use it, if you like, so you've got that right mm. to use it. If you, I, I, I'm sort of, I, I, don't get me wrong, I do like emulation because I think it's, when I want to play something, it's like quick and easy, just put it on, play it, and not have to mess about. But um, next to me, I've got my Amiga, which is what my favourite computer. It, it is the original one. And like you say, a lot of that is that um, aesthetic of it, the touching, the sound, the yeah, the smell even. It's just weird, isn't it? <laughs> oh, the wear of the disc, you know, the yeah. the actual load times. You know, it's it's all those things. <clears throat> it's that it's re-experience. It's re, get the, redoing the, experience, the original experience in its full. Yeah. yeah, emulation is great for convenience, um, and emulation is great for developers to make stuff, but they still need to test it on real hardware because I don't know how many new developers have come along and whipped up this thing, <laughs> and everybody's gone, oh, it's great. Oh, it doesn't work on real hardware. Yeah, because it's, well, a lot of the emulators, even though they claim to be 100% perfect, they're never going to be because there's so many quirks of machines, isn't there? When, you know, oh, there is. Yeah, well, I'll take the Coleco emulators, just, just those. There are quite a few different ones, and your title will behave differently on all of them. Um, and then you put it in real hardware and it won't work. And I've had the same trouble with the Nintendo development as well. Um, yeah. Like, uh, little did I know that if you use one particular colour in the palette, it locks the system up. <laughs> well, there's, the, a the, bug in, there's a bug in the hardware. Well, the, the NES is, I know when they tried to do the emulation, this, is it something to do with mappers and stuff? There's so many things that they've never actually really got that perfect either. So, Oh, no, and there's also, um, you can make something for a um, a pretend mapper for the NES. Yeah. So some of the music demos are done with a pretend mapper and they'll never work on a real on the real hardware. Yeah, because they've been hacked, if you like, to, to work whichever they do with. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, somebody might be able to make a piece of hardware that, that does that mapper on the real NES, but, yeah, yeah. there are several of those around. Um, and the NES is a particularly... It's an interest. I mean, I've done it. And uh, this is the thing. I was basically a Z80, um, you know, Coleco MSX bit video programmer. Um, but obviously, doing stuff for Collectivision, uh, John Gamester eighty one um, was putting on his Game On Expo for the first time over in Arizona, and he wanted to recreate the Nintendo World Championships. Yeah. So he said, "Oh, Tony, you know how to program these old systems. How about you write a Nintendo World Championship cartridge, a new one, for us?" Um, and I went, oh, okay, I hadn't done 6502 at all before then. Um, so in three months, I wrote three mini games, and one of them ended up being a, a really quick port of my Media Swarm. Um, so I wrote a Sydney Hunter mini game, a racing game called Pedal to the Metal, which was the most challenging, took the most time, and then ported my Media Swarm as the third game in the series. So you've got your six and a half minutes and uh, you get your score at the end, just like the original uh, thing. Um, and they, I got it done like a couple of days before the, um, the convention. They put them on cartridges and they had them out there to sell. Um, he even made six gold cartridges, and I've got one of those. Oh, brilliant. Um, and I've got a, a normal one as well. Um, so I learned the Nintendo and, and chucked together tools as quickly as I could and improved those tools. Um, and then they did a Kickstarter on the original Sydney Hunter and the Caverns of Death for the Super Nintendo. And one of the stretch goals, they said, oh, we'll write a NES version. <laughs> and you could see and your name already flashing on the screen. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so I've been working on that for three years, um, and it, the game is actually almost finished. Um, I've had lots of technical difficulties, because the NES is not the NES. Yeah, no. um, like, like recent, I've recently, I'm, I've got all the way up to the end of level seven of um, defining the game and I've got all the actions working. I ran out of room. Um, <laughs> so I've had to change uh, the compression routine, which is what I'm currently doing at the moment. I know I can fit it now. I've just got to get the decompressor working in on 6502. I'm not as good at 6502 as I am Z80. So. Is that always in the back of your mind when you're writing extra bits and extra bits? You're thinking, oh, the memory, the memory, or... Do you just mm -hmm. write it? Or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yes, you always have to be mindful of your the restrictions of your environment. So, um, uh, like the, the NES, I mean, you can actually, like, it's not easy to have, a, like, a 128K or even a 256K game, but at any one point in time, you can only have two of those 16Ks yeah. available. So my running out of space, I haven't run out of space in the cartridge, I've run out of space in one 16K bank. Yeah. It, it, it fascinates me because I, I, I so wish that back in the day I, I did, I I did take more notice of it and learnt it better, but at that time I was just more inter interested in playing the games more so than writing them. But now, because I get older, I'm more interested in how they work and how does that mm. do that. It's funny, isn't it, how your perspective changes over time? Yeah, well, I find I mean, look, don't get me wrong, I like playing games, um, but I'm not very good at like sitting down and sticking to a game. I'll I'll come in and have a game session. I'll have one game of that, and I'll have one game of that, and I'll have one game of that. I, yeah. I won't stick there and try and see whether I can finish that game or just keep at it until I can... Um, so I haven't finished a lot, hell of a lot of the games in my collection, but I like experiencing new games um, to see what people have done, especially MSX games and, and uh, to a lesser extent, Coleco games, because I want to see what they do with the hardware. And there have yeah. been some very good homebrews where some people have got an excellent handle on the hardware. It's funny because I was watching the, one of the latest videos you posted with the um, the platformer game, and it just reminded me of um, a modern mobile game. And I'm thinking, how are they doing that on a, an MSX? <laughs> Do you oh, know what I mean? The, the, yeah. the jumping llama. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, when I first, the developer contacted me and said, would you like to review our game? And I said, I'd be, I'd be happy to always love looking at new games. And I loaded it up and I went, oh, my God, this is just so... It just pops off the screen and you go, is this running on an MSX? And <laughs> yeah, you put the cartridge it, in, it's it actually really... got an Android inside the cartridge. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, so when I get the physical version of that, so I bought a copy straight away. <coughs> I play it again and do another video because yeah, it's, it's yeah. definitely worth it. And and maybe I'm just hinting they'll do my suggestion of putting in level codes so you can not yeah, have so to start from this. <laughs> I thought that. <laughs> do, do you think the um, especially the MSX was ahead of its time in what it was trying to do because it's quite interesting that they were wanting a machine, well, multiple machines that could run the same, but nowadays it's sort of the same idea but the opposite way around. All the machines could cross, well, they tried to do cross play. <laughs> Which will play a game, yeah. but on their machine. So the idea is the same. They've just tipped it on its head. Do you think? Yeah, well, it's it's all down to standards, right? So back in the day, there were no standards, right? And all of the computers were different. None of them would interact. So at the time, it was very appealing. And Bill Gates bet on two horses. So MSX was the horse for the home, and IBM was the bet for business. Um, but they ended up merging and then Bill Gates said oh, I'll just go with the IBM side of things so mm. he he didn't just he just stopped mentioning MSX at some stage if you know what I mean um, and the one big mistake that the Japanese did was they tried to sell it like they do in Japan like stereo equipment oh uh, yeah yeah right so it sold it sold gangbusters in Japan right yeah. that, this is what people don't understand MSX was the thing yeah. in Japan. Yeah. Right? There were other PCs as well that it was competing with, but it was toe-to-toe -to -toe market share, and it was in a lot of places, which is why you can still find a lot of MSX stuff in dribs and drabs in yeah. Japan. Um, and people, when they find out how many games were published for MSX, uh, go, oh, really? That many? Yeah. And from so many different publishers. And then you've got so many games that started on MSX. So a lot of the companies, they wrote the first version of that game for MSX. Metal like Gear Solid. Bomber Man. Yeah. Oh, and Metal Gear, yeah, Metal Gear yeah, Solid. It was, yeah. The, yeah. It, was, it was his favorite platform, right? So everything had to go on the MSX first. Castlevania was actually made for the MSX and the NES at the same time. It's another one of the parallel ones. It came out for the MSX a little later. Um, same as Metal Gear. They had a parallel one for the NES. It was much simpler. Mm. Right, but the original game was for MSX. It, it's, um, a, it's a bit like history, isn't it? Where they say people will only remember what the victor tells them. So if the NES sold more, everybody automatically thinks it came out for that. But in reality, there's one behind it. <laughs> that's that's good. But uh, like Castlevania it came out on the Nintendo disc system first, and then the MSX cartridge came out, which is, um, and then you had the NES cartridge came out after that. Um, but obviously, the Castlevania for MSX is a lot more complicated than the original Castlevania on the um, on the Famicom. Um, and uh, as I said, other games uh, that were first on the MSX was Bomberman, the very first Bomberman game, and that was even on a what's called a B card. So the very first the ones, the things that morphed into Hue cards later right, yeah, yeah. for the um, for the PC Engine, because that was that was NEC. Um, and and Hudson, right? So the original Bomberman was made by Hudson, so it was one of their primary games. So of course that went over to the PC Engine after that. Yeah, so that that's how it transferred over, then, is it? Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. I never thought of it until you just said it about how you said they tried to market it like they did, um, like hi fi's and things, because in this country. I remember the Toshiba advert on the telly, and it was very much like that. Like it, you know, like they advertised TVs, and, mm. and it was, it was just weird. But I think that was probably part of the problem, like you say. But I've never thought of it till you just said. People thought, well, they make TVs. Why would, why would I buy a computer from them? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes, exactly. And it was the yeah. wrong. That's it. They, they literally overseas tried to market them as, you know, as basically hi-fi equipment, as they would hi-fi equipment. And if you think about it, most of the machines are actually <clears throat> quite, they had a lot with them. They had full travel keyboards in most cases. And they mostly had 3264K of RAM, which not all of the machines that came out at the same time had those specs. Um, people forget that the fact that the Commodore 64 came with 64K um, uh, of RAM was a big thing yeah. at the time, right? Um, 
which allowed to, to survive and get through. But at the end of the day, they were able to control their price more. Yeah. Because uh, the Commodore 64 failed when it first came out because it was expensive. Yeah. yeah. Nobody could afford to buy one. They were tremendously unreliable. Yeah. And it took them a while and they, um, they had to reduce the price to compete and then they had to make them better so yeah. <laughs> they didn't go broke. But they had, you know, they owned the chips. Yeah. You know, they owned the production of the chips and stuff. So it became the great machine that it is. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't on the first try. Right? Oh. It was it was expensive to start with, um, and the MSX machines were cheaper than the Commodore sixty four, but they were up there. Yeah, well, um, I think they were two hundred and ninety nine pounds in this country when they first came out. Yes, which is a lot. So, how much was the Commodore sixty four when it was first released? In I know the Australian price was five hundred and ninety nine dollars. Would that be equate to about three hundred and ninety nine pounds, roughly? That's I think that's how much it was. About rough back then, yeah, things yeah. didn't directly double. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, and so you, you were right. There was that, that was the old bread bin model, obviously, when that came mm-hmm. out, and you just couldn't afford it. Um, and that's hence why I, I remember it well. Everybody at school had the C sixty four, but my obviously my parents we weren't we weren't rich in them days. We're not rich now, <laughs> but um, our local <laughs> electrical shop. Uh, had an MSX in the window, and it was just at the time when they'd been reduced down to the ninety-nine pound bundle packs, the HX10. Yes, and I think what was the selling point was the fact that it came with a tape recorder and the plug and the actual screwdriver. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because in them yeah, days, so everything, yeah, everything, yeah, everything, yeah, that's right. So it was yeah. actually a very good bundle for the time. So exactly, and the, and they thought, oh, well, it's a computer; it must do the same thing, and that's how I got that. But. Mm. I think the problem was, and, and this is again, different regions, in the UK, because the Spectrum and the C64 was big, everything was more a port of the Spectrum, most things anyway, but whereas in Japan they, were, they didn't have that constraint, did they? They could make the game specifically for that machine, because it mm-hmm. was quite big. Yeah, and um, yeah, a lot of the UK software houses... Um, you know, they just did quick ports. So a lot of the UK titles, um, there's a, like a Gremlin Graphics Spectrum Emulation Emulin Engine that was then itself. I, I'm not 100 percent sure if that's the original one, but it seems to be very similar in a lot of other systems. And so the the um, the you know the Z80 is running at the same speed. It's emulating another system. Uh, the, spe- the Spectrum has direct access to the memory that's going to the screen whereas the msx it's a separate it's pretty much a separate processor so you've got to transfer stuff across and you can only do that so many frames um and it was just very disappointing for some games like um you know one of one, one of my most disappointing is like xenon you know yeah. from bitmap brothers they didn't do anything it's just a straight <laughs> spectrum port they could have just yeah. you know at least replaced the main ship with a sprite and you know it yeah um, and some other, some some tried. So, like Alligator Software, they the games look better than the Spectrum ones and play faster because they use sprites and they can use more of the color definition. Right? Yeah. They still look very primitive compared to some of the um, Japanese games, um, but they tried. And then you've got all the software that came out in the Netherlands from AcoSoft. Yeah. Um, now some of the, some of those, just like some of the UK ones, broke some of the rules. Um, so obviously to stay compatible, you're supposed to use the BIOS in the machine. And one of the things is the way you access the extra memory. It's not determined that it's going to be there in the slots. You have yeah. to ask it where it is first. Yeah. But a lot of the software doesn't load on some machines because they just assume yeah. that the uh, memory's, extra memory is going to be in that bag. Um, so, so, so that's what... why some type of software can be hit and miss. Where, where did that like rules that they were supposed to follow? If they were going to be part of the MSX like contingent, if you like, it, there was yes, yes, and, and some of the um, so there was actually I believe in the UK an MSX association, yeah, um, and those developers used the Einstein computer as their development platform. So that's when all the versions of Elite were programmed and Manic Miner, Jet Set Willy, um, is there another game? I'm just trying to think, but all those versions were programmed for. All of the systems, uh, other than the original BBC Micro for the, um, you know, so all the Z80 versions were made on an Einstein, um, which is another machine that is MSX-like but not MSX compatible. 
Right. You see, you see, but it you had full travel keyboard and it had disk drives and you never so realized great development this. Thing. You never realise this looking back, do you, that everything was came from sort of one baby, if you like, and it was just sort of tweaked to fit into wherever it wanted. So it was almost like you were trying to put a, a square peg in a round hole, but you were like just trying to shave the side so it fit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and a lot of those people who were doing ports, to be fair to them, were given very little time to do them. Yeah. So, of course, they're going to come up with an engine and... Yeah you know, do these rough and ready ports. The Amstrad suffered as well yes. um, from quick spectrum ports. You know, it's got a very, I mean, it's not, it's not a super fast machine, but if you program directly to its, um, you know, graphics capabilities, you can make much better games. Um, it, it probably suffered, do you think, from the age old, age old that there was, everybody was releasing computers, so software houses had to be, more picky of how they were oh, going yeah. to make money, simply, weren't it? And remember, though, it's the days of publishing titles for a pound or two pound, you know, so you have to sell an awful lot of those to make money. So you kind of spent a lot of money making the piece of software. So yeah. a lot of bedroom coders didn't get a lot of money. No, yeah. The, the, uh, how did it feel when you when you first... Can you remember the first one you sold and how it felt? Because obviously you'd written it and somebody else wanted it. Yeah, well, it was sort of like um, I wrote I wrote those couple of games which were published as listings, um, and then other people were desperate for software, and they said, "Oh," and I believe actually, no, you've just triggered a memory. I believe, and this is the person's whose deceased estate I have gotten hold of his old Spectre video and some of my original tapes was the very first person that basically said, "You should sell these, Tony. <laughs> Put them on a tape, and I'll buy a copy." And he was a he was a teacher as well, uh, so he was older than me. So um, yeah, unfortunately, he passed away. I didn't even know he passed away about three years ago. Uh, and one of my friends found all the Spectre video gear underneath somebody's house, okay. and it was his. And I know it was his because it has his uni. He used to work at the university here, and his uni ID <laughs> in the bottom of one of the things. Um, and um, yeah, from that one, I've actually got back some copies because when I, as you do back in the day, when I moved from um, Spectre Video to MSX, well, when I went from a Spectre Video 318 to 328, I sold my 318. Um, I did actually keep my 328 when I bought my 728. Um, I sold the 728 to get a 738, <laughs> the one with the disk drive on the side. But at some stage, I sold all my original um, tapes from the Spectre video. Yeah, so I have... So a place in Western Australia continued to publish my titles after I did. And that's one of the ones. This is from the deceased estate. Oh, so that's that. Forest Data Services in Western Australia. So that's one of my titles. Um, that's crazy. <laughs> right. Um, and I'm... Uh, you know, trying to recover the game. I mean, I, look, my backup thing is I have all the MSX ones and all the code. I could back port them to the Spectre video, which I might do for a couple of them. But I have um, managed to make a replica of Program Pack 1. We've been, it's got a new cover. So back in the day, they had much more basic covers. So this is my general muck around workstation. So I have these things. <laughs> so this is... This is how I used to publish my games. Written on like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can remember seeing them on the on the market stalls like that. <laughs> so once again, at the ceased estate, so he's got his handwriting on things, but he didn't even have a cassette label. He just had handwritten on the tape. <laughs> I got more professional later on. So I'm looking at restoring and publishing them like that. Yeah. And that they'll have stick-on labels on the cassette. I haven't put one on there, but that was just a sample cover. So the original yeah, game was Sprite Diviner, Lunar Lander, Road Racer. That was the other one, Galactic Assault. Road so Racer. That's the very first proper released um, Electric Adventures title. Did you think for one minute that in 2021 you would be talking about them? <laughs> no. Well, listen, I'd actually put everything away. Everything was in storage. There were things that bits and pieces I had left. And then, I think it's probably 14 or 15 years ago, um, I, 
got my MSX computers out again and started playing with them. Um, and then a little while ago, my that original friend who used to have a Spectre video through and out as well and programmed the cricket game, uh, left the state of Tasmania um, and showed at my house and dropped off his Atari 2600 and all the games. Oh, flip it out. Which is the system I used to go around his place and play when I was a kid. He said, you and I had heaps of t great times this, and I know you're still into this stuff. And he also gave me his Spectre Video 738, so I actually have a second one. Um, so he went all the way up to the MSX era with me. Um, and that's and then I found an Atari XEGS bundle and things just, that's this is how I got a collection, if you know what I mean. Now I did have a lot of computers. Um, they were just all in storage um, and done some training and hobby, but of course I have bought more. Um, yes. <laughs> You've only got to watch your videos to see that because I remember watching the first ones where you did a, t a room of your, like a tour of your mm. room, if you like. And if you watch the one later when it gets a bit bigger, then the later one you've got like arcade machines and games mm -hmm. all over the place. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do need to do a new room tour, um, but um, uh, me being me, I've got to do some tidying up first because I just, I just <laughs> couldn't bear to do it without trying to bring the place in order a little bit more. I don't know how you get the time because obviously you, you talk about all the projects you've got going and the games you're doing. Is it like, do you ever find that sometimes you get burnt out doing it so you take a break from it then come back to it? Or oh, oh, definitely. And this is why if you have a look at the number of games I've got in development, I go through them in rotation and interest, if you know what I mean. So, mm. uh, you know, Sydney Hunter has been extremely frustrating on occasions, you know, the technical hurdles I've had to go through and you just get sick of it and you go why am I programming on the 6502 and it's horrible Nintendo you know it's so slow uh, I want to go and do my Z80 and click on MSX again uh, and I'll go do that for a while so yeah. um, it does take a while um, and you know I I've had some health challenges as well so yeah. you know my back is very very bad um, I've already had one operation so to my neck um, and another recent procedure on my lower back. So, uh, and I work full time, and I'm busy doing that. I have four beautiful girls, uh, three of which are pretty much grown up, and a grandchild now. So, I was just about to say, I think you became a granddad recently, didn't you? As well, a couple of yes. Weeks ago. So, so yes, well, with four girls, I suppose it was eventually going to happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. Obviously, like we've, we've touched on, you, you started to get into the arcade machine side of things and it sort of started out small and now it seems to be growing and growing and growing. <laughs> yeah, well, um, obviously, um, my original interest back in the day were, was arcade games. I used to love the arcades. Um, I, you know, Space Invaders was a groundbreaking moment for me, as was Donkey Kong. Space Invaders and Donkey Kong were the first games I played at a local fish and chip shop. <laughs> And we were lucky to have an arcade called Flashback down here. So and that had original imported machines. So nothing built locally or anything. Like that. So they were original machines. So I played an original Battle Zone. I played an original Lunar Lander with the lever. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, Asteroids and Defender. Um, and all those, that's what I fell in love with as far as games are concerned. Um, and... I've always wanted to have arcade games on shelf myself. I haven't put a lot of money into them. The, the machines that I have, I have come by at an opportune moment. So there's no been no rhyme or reason why I've got any particular machine at any particular time. Um, and I've always been into electronics. So it was another one of my hobbies when I was growing up. My father was into electronics in a big way. Um, and I... As long as, once again, it's, it's all to do with focus. I only have limited time. So electronics can take quite some time to nut out. So if you have a good session, you can maybe get some things working. Or you can make some things worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I have, I think, almost 60 arcade boards. Um, and I have, and uh, you know, certain cabinets, I've picked them up because of the opportunity. So I've got an original Sega Galaxian sit-down cocktail table. That was basically thrown out on the tip. It, um, it needs a lot of work, but I got it for a hundred dollars, so um, I will fix it one day. Um, I have an original Berserk machine 
which was imported from the US at some stage. It is mostly working. So um, <laughs> it's actually one of my machines that there isn't anything wrong with the screen. Um, I've unfortunately of late had quite a few of the, the chassis that drives the tubes have developed faults. Mm. Um, so I need to, um, and basically those, you just got to recap the whole, the whole thing and use the right capacitors. I'm sure uh, I've been mentioning my, um, Tutankhamun machine, which is real sad because I really like playing that one. Uh, it only lasts about, you know, five, six minutes and then goes dark. <laughs> so uh, it, you're rushing to try and get this. <laughs> yeah, it has had the capacitors done by somebody else, but I suspect they've used the wrong voltage capacitors. So it's not holding its charge. No. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's, um, I, I suppose as well, you've got to remember that they could probably get the machines a uh, are really well they're getting old aren't they parts fail and things so. oh yeah you have like well, like that one i thought it was the the brightness uh, adjuster on the chassis board and then because you, you knocked it and it and the brightness came back sometimes uh, it was a double one of those double problems if you know what i mean and in the end it was it wasn't just that the solder had gone it was that the pad was gone mm. so the the trace had come completely off the board so I thought, ah, oh, right, I can fix this. I'll do a bypass. <laughs> Did a bypass. Yes, stable. Doesn't flicker at all. Fine. Played the game, got to level four, went dark again. I went, oh. <laughs> but you hate it when you think you so, fixed something, uh, then, it just, then it suddenly comes so, back. So I'm actually really good at getting to level four on Tut and Come, but I, <laughs> I can't get any further because as fast as I go, I can't go <laughs> fast enough for the machine to stay up. Um, and I've got my sit down. I've got a... a, a a general Hankin sit-down cocktail that I've got Time Pilot in. Uh, it's quite a solid one. That's that's good and reliable. I found a uh, Konami checkered flag locally, which is related to an MSX game. Really? So the F1 game on MSX is actually related to checkered flag in the arcade. I never knew that. Good day. So, um, and it's a Konami. I have a lot of Konami games, a lot of Konami boards. So I suppose if you're going to say, what's Tony's, um, <laughs> you know, bent, it's probably Konami. There's a lot of Konami in this room. So across many, many systems. I have, a, you know, a knock together cabinet that my brother-in-law made that I put a Neo Geo MVS in. It's also got a main PC in there, but I never use it for that. And my very first arcade game is an upright general arcade machine that was popular here in Australia. Um, that's worked really well for a while, but it made a nice big crack sound one day and the monitor stays dark. Oh, dear. <laughs> the crack of doom. <laughs> the crack of doom. So I'm hoping that's not the, um, the flyback. Uh, otherwise, I'm doomed. And that chassis has actually been reconditioned once by a... You know, a pretty decent job here, uh, mob here in Australia at once. So I'm worried about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I noticed as well, I watched the, one of the videos you've done recently was the Capcom joystick board. You know, the, yes. the, the, have you? how are you finding that? Is it? Is it what you want to? Um, yeah, well, I, it, it's, it is definitely a thing I got to play, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> and I don't have any of those... Uh, there's quite a few of those arcade stick things that plug into a modern TV unit. So it's my first one of those. And I do know that you can boot from a USB and basically put RetroArc on that or something similar, and it'll run main. I'm not at that stage yet. I've basically I've got the original unit. I've um, upgraded the firmware to version 1.6, which is after the video that I showed. Um, and that makes a lot of improvements to the games. I had a lot of trouble doing it because the Wi-Fi signal in here is not very strong because it's a tin shed. Yeah. I had to take it inside the house after trying for multiple hours to do it inside <laughs> here. Um, and it did it in like 10 minutes when I took it inside. and went, ah, oh, stupid person. <laughs> it wasn't saying that. It was just taking a long time. Yeah. Right? Um, and it was obviously just trying to get blocks and failing. It shows that what they've built is actually very robust. So... I don't know how many half builds I did trying to do those upgrades, um, but it recovered from it. So they've done it. I mean, don't get me wrong; it is built very well. I still think it's a bit ugly, um, but yeah. it's got really nice sticks in it. It's got really nice buttons. 
Um, I, so far, I like playing, uh, was it 1940 uh, for Spin Master, isn't it? Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember the game. Um, <clears throat> it's got uh, Ghouls and Ghosts. I love that. Um, the hardest game It's got ever. Strider on it. <laughs> yeah, and it's got Strider on it, which I've never played in the arcade, and I still haven't actually played on this. Um, and Giga Wing. Um, and um, uh, Aliens vs. Predator. Oh, it is oh, the beat em up Aliens vs. Predator game. Yeah. Is that the one where it's like a final fight type game where you're walking, scrolling? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, and there's um, Captain Commando, which is another good final fight like game as well. So there's actually more on there than I expected that I would like. So I'm not the one game genre that I've never really gotten into is the one on one fighter yeah. and the brawler which is Captain Commander and the, the like, it's so, I sort of missed back in the day. So it's a thing that I discovered I liked when I took part in one of the uh, Tuba's high school challenges. Yeah. And I went, oh, these are actually quite good fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, I quite like the um, MVS games and then I discovered, because I've got an MVS multi-cartridge, so uh, there's quite a few games on there that I like. Um, and I do have a Neo Geo CD unit with quite a few games as well. Well, Neo... um, MVS real real cartridges. I only have two. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're, three. they're quite expensive, aren't they? The cartridges. Oh, they are. Yeah, and because I've got the Neo Geo CD, we're a pretty. I've got all the shooters, um, and I've got several of the beat 'em up games and things like that. Um, uh, I've and I've got some fighters that I got cheap, but I don't play those ones. So, um, they're just. I've just, I suppose it was just a thing that pass me by you know the only only thing of that genre that i played back in the day was yeah kung fu on <laughs> on the msx yeah and then they never quite never quite grabbed me so i just say it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and thank you so much for taking the time out to to do this um no i've thoroughly enjoyed it so and, and i wish you all the best with all the myriads of projects you've got going and your tapes and things so well, I'll constantly make progress on them, and I'm not going anywhere. So, you know, you know, some, sometimes my video output might drop for a little bit, but yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll still be going. <laughs> Next time on a retro ramble, you knew it. You had like, you know, Mark Cerny and all that in America, or Sega America, who was like, "Well, screw what they're doing over there in Japan. We yeah. we'll do our own thing." And then they didn't get Sonic Extreme out on the Saturn, which was a big failing. That's where it went wrong. I would just like to say a big thank you to all the special guests who took the time out of their busy schedules to appear on Retro Ramble. It is really much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of the Retro Ramble with. All links to the special guest channel can be found in the description below this video. If you enjoyed watching then please like and subscribe and click the bell notification icon to be informed of when the next episode is uploaded.